Hello, and welcome to Ask an Archaeologist. I'm Paul Duncan McGarrity. Hello and welcome to another episode of Ask an Archaeologist with me, Paul Duncan McGarrity. Uh, this episode we're talking to Izzy Lawrence, one of the co-presenters uh, of Making History from BBC Radio 4. Um, we get into a little bit of uh, how she got into history and performing history comedy and all of the history podcasts that she puts on, like The Z List, Dead List and um, Sepisot. I can't remember how to say it. Basically, it's the word opposite written backwards. Uh, it's a really cool one. Um, yeah, that's that. Not really much else to say other than uh, I think it's time for another question and answer podcast coming up soon, I think. So, as always, if you have any questions, please send them over. Um, you can do that at Ask an Arc on Twitter. Uh, it's usually the best way of getting hold of me. I am... Uh, the most reliable uh, when it comes to that particular conduit of communication. Uh, other than that, uh, hello again to quite a lot of people listening in California this month. That's nice. Uh, r a weirdly large spike in Alaska. Hello to you. Uh, hello to all the Swedish and Norwegians who are joining me. It's uh, basically, you can tell that I found the bit of the hosting website that tells me where in the world people are listening. And uh, I'm obsessed with it. It's great. Um, what else? Is there anything else going on that I need to talk to you about? Uh, nah, work's been fine. <laughs> Uh, but, uh, oh, uh, thanks to a couple of people who've popped along to gigs as well. If you want to find out um, where I'm going to be on... Uh, you could go to uh, paulduncanmcgarrity.co.uk, my website, and that'll uh, uh, occasionally have links to various uh, gigs that I'm doing, uh, which seems apt considering uh, uh, Izzy is also one of those uh, mythical historical comedians that... Uh, that we, we, we all know each other, but we don't get booked on the same gigs because, God forbid, you learn too much in one night. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Like I say, uh, if you've got any questions, let me know. If you've got anyone who thinks uh, might enjoy this podcast, pass it on to them. Thanks for the reviews. Thanks for the ratings. If you do any more of them, that's super. And um, until next we cross paths, uh, yeah. Enjoy this episode, and thank you for your questions thus far. Bye-bye. Hello. Hello. How are you doing? I'm all right. I'm, I'm, I'm having this sort of weird... I've just had technically what I would call a week off, because... Making history finished on uh, on Tuesday, and now I'm just like uh, 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 I'm waiting to hear back from a few projects, and it's just like I'm in I'm in the middle of things. Technically, I should be like writing up things and getting ready for meetings, that sort of stuff. But actually, sitting on my ass is quite good. So that is what I've been up to. Well, that's exciting, and it's sort of um, that's some sort of foreshadowing of what we're going to talk about oh, uh, later in the episode. Oh. That's quite nice. Oh no, no, it's beautiful. It's a, a little bit of actual dramatic tension within the whole thing, yeah. as we we finally see. You know, we we started with the end, and we find out that you are the presenter of Making History on BBC Ooh, Radio Four. That is true. I'm a co-presenter alongside. It's it's freaky because I'm co-presenting it with Tom Holland, which. <laughs> Is terrifying because simply I, I didn't do um, history at uh, university, so I, I did a different subject. And as a result, most of my history is spent just reading popular history books. And so pretty much all my ancient Greek history <laughs> is from Tom Holland, Tom Holland. <laughs> who I'm trying to argue with and tell him that he's wrong because I read this book once. Oh, it was his book. I'll shut up. Ah. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> but uh, on the other hand, he knows nothing of many things, which like Star Trek which I can, um, or Doctor Who. He never watched Doctor Who. Can you believe it? 
So how many uh, discussions of uh, of sort of like ancient Greek archaeology do you like? That reminds me of that time Kirk went to that. He's like, ah, oh, she's turning it again. It's because I once played a role game, a role game plane. I I once um, spooned a rhythm. No, I once play, played a role playing game um, involved in you know with, in the Star Trek universe. And in this particular role playing game, they had Thucydides class ships, which yeah. is the only thing because Thucydides came up, and I was like, now I know he's Greek. Yeah. And I know he must be a historian because they've also got Herodotus class. So <laughs> 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 that is how I knew that Thucydides was. Yeah, I'm. Um, I'm a failure, is what I am. Because I got there, and I got called a nerd on national radio. <laughs> that you got called a nerd on nas- on Radio Four. Exactly. Someone listening to Radio Four felt that they were within their rights to go. Well, I'm listening to Radio Four, but this person is a nerd. Exactly. Uh, it's it, it is that sort of thing. Although I did also my my favourite thing in the last series was I made beef dripping because I'm a southerner. I've never eaten beef dripping before, and it was a right. staple part of a Yorkshire diet. Was beef dripping back in 190? Uh, back in 1900. Anyway, so I made some beef dripping, and then I sampled it, and I spoke on Radio Four with my mouth full, which oh. I think is yeah, an I amazing. Believe- isn't that something that can get you? I wasn't that like within the treason laws. Yeah, I think I think the queen. It's like, it's like killing a swan. It really. Yeah, is. yeah. yeah. Uh, she was she was talking and quite muffled on the BBC, and I, we believe that she should be removed from the country. Indeed, that is uh, that's true. But you're fine, me. And uh, yeah, you can't now because I'm not on the radio for another few months. So yay. So how's about we talk about? Uh, the origin stories of the Z Lawrence. Oh, First no. of all, oh, no. uh, you have you are one of the co-presenters of Making History, but it's I, interesting. Uh, what what sort of uh, background do you have in, in regards <laughs> history? You've already said did do a degree in it. Did I did. Degree, I did. I did. I did a humanities degree, but I've got a science degree because I mm. that that subject um, was geography. Shut up, it counts. Um, but yeah, I did. I did geography for the same reason anybody does geography. I fancied my geography teacher and got very good grades. And <laughs> it was. It was. Good. I only got a B in history at A level. I did do it yeah. for A level, but I got a B because I said that Stalin had a point, and that was considered. <laughs> <laughs> well, look. I, you know, because well, what they wanted you to write was the Red Terror was an absolute terrible thing, and he killed all of these people and accused them falsely of treason. I'm just like, well, to be fair, a lot of those people. I know there's no proof, and Stalin had no proof, but I'd have tried to kill him. Oh, yeah. So you know, I think it's fair to say, had they the opportunity, they would have anyway. No, that gets you a B. <laughs> Don't say that. Toe, I'm, toe the A level line. I'm genuinely impressed that they went as high as a B. Like, she's <laughs> argued it well. She's used her evidence, but exactly. it is Stalin. Exactly. But you know, I think I think I did I did, I did all right. I I I got good grades in my Hitler stuff and uh, a few other bits. So. <laughs> because you went Hitler, Hitler was a bad. No point. He was a bad man. He was a bad man. I got that he bit was right. A bad man. But, uh, he was a bad man. Yeah. Stalin. Um, what was it? Have you ever listened to, uh, again, I'm advertising other podcasts. With yeah. Podcasts. Have you listened to Behind the Bastards? I have not. Uh, Behind the Bastards is probably my favourite uh, podcast, uh, like, of, of, of all of them that I listen of to. all of them, that's quite of a... all of yeah. them I listen to. Uh, it's really well researched, but he talks about um, the side of uh, the worst people in history that you might not necessarily be aware of. Uh, he just did a really interesting episode on anti-vaccination uh, movements. Oh, and, the uh, cowpox and yeah, yeah, and all that sort of stuff. But how how uh, how it's a, a little bit murky when it first starts, but now less yeah. murky. Now, now it's more like scam artists. Well, then it was actually giving people cowpox, so you were sick for a bit. The other thing is that I mean, listen to the episode. I don't want to ruin yeah. it, but. His one about uh, Stalin is amazing because he basically uh, he talks a lot about the parties that Stalin would um, require the Politburo to be at. And <laughs> apparently they were so um, over the top that an ornamental pool had to be filled in by uh, Stalin's bodyguards because they thought members of the Politburo might fall in it and drown. Wow, that's <laughs> epic. Well, yeah. uh, one of my favourite um, bits during the Red Terror was um, it was at the end of a performance... And at the end of the performance, the people bow, 
and then and then they say and just uh, the great leader and they so they start clapping so they continue clapping and it goes on for about 20 minutes because nobody wants to be the first person to stop <laughs> eventually one guy at the front stops clapping and as one the exhausted audience just sit, stops right <laughs> and that guy was executed uh... <laughs> <laughs> yay stalin so, um, do you know that 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 story? What I'm taking away from that story is you've got to work on your cardio. Yeah, you really do in order to live under a tyrannical reign. Well, yeah, yeah, there were some ridiculously fit people like Stakhanov, who um like he was a coal miner and he just basically did the job of about 24 men. Yeah, and made everybody else look crap. Or at least but, you know. that's what the propaganda department. Well, exactly. Yay. They they had like fun little jingles for him. Stakhanov. Yeah. Yeah. It's like Stakhanov shifted tons of coal. You do the same, we'll reach our goal. Go Stalin. <laughs> that that is that is not that is not true. <laughs> no, but but clearly, there is a real interest in it and a bit of a passion for history. So whilst you didn't study it, what were kind of like your first um what were the first kind of uh, instances where you were aware that it might be something you were interested in? Well, I, I, like literally as a kid, going around castles. I think that was get to visit Warwick Castle when you're a kid, and it's one of those. <laughs> it's the difference to the science because you know, you know, when you go to the science museum or you go like Natural History Museum is a bit of in the middle, but it's you know, it's when you go into a museum, what you're looking forward to is it the gift shop. And if it's a science museum, it's a gift shop, mainly because they have space food in the science museum gift shop. But, you know, in history, British Museum, it was the stuff. It was, I want to be able to write my name in hieroglyphs and I want to do all sorts of exciting things. So I think, and also stories. I was I was always very into reading lots and I liked books set in the past. But I include things like Goodnight Mr. Tom in that, you know, yeah. <laughs> the ancient past. Um, but yeah, no, so it's it's what that. Is this the 50s you speak of? I know, it's so, but it's crazy. It really is. It's like Mad Men, except nobody's bonking. Uh, that is, that is what <laughs> I can absolutely about. guarantee people were bonking in the past. Yeah. And my evidence is everyone <laughs> this is this is unfortunately the case. There is a lot of bonking that's happened. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so so I mean, it, there's no really, there's not really a pinpoint. I think if if you had to sort of boil down history to me, it is. Um, I think I just think it's the thing that we're all programmed to adore because it is storytelling, it is learning from mistakes, and that is a key part of our humanity and our survival. It is why we sp we we speak a language because of history and learning from history and knowing history. Therefore, it's innate in all of us. And if you don't like history, you're a weirdo. <laughs> you're just you're just not human i don't understand anybody because even if you're not interested you know say you're only interested in like teacups and modern teacups you're gonna be interested in where the design came from mm. everything has a history and that is why you just yeah. yeah history isn't history isn't really a subject it's just everything a bit further along ago you know that is you know sorry is, is it, no 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 it's quite interesting but i was just wondering could you argue that sometimes people aren't interested in history because of the stories that are being told? Like, is there, um, yeah, is there, a, is there a, a tendency within the uh, when people recount history to, to cover the same sort of topics? Divorce, beheaded, died. Divorce, <laughs> beheaded, died. Yeah, no, it is. Um, I'm sorry, I've not heard that before. Exactly. Who, who, could, who could possibly? But you know, you you study the Tudors because the War of the Roses is too complicated. Everybody, you know, that is why you do it. It's it's because the War of the Roses is crazy. But um, yeah, it you do gear towards, but you always gear towards the same story. So you want to talk about religion and state. You look at the Tudors and it's fun because it's all about lots of different wives and weird mucked up families and that sort of thing. For me, you see history took a, I remember being put off a lot because when I was a kid, it was always about the people. So you'd learn about Boudicca. You wouldn't learn about Iron Age people. You'd learn about Julius Caesar. You wouldn't learn about Romans. And therefore there's, a story as a character you could get involved with and imagine and then suddenly it was and we found this body in a peat bog and it was before i got into agatha christie so i didn't really understand like oh actually we can find out about how he lived and all these things i, was like, I don't care he's not a king w what do you mean he might be a king i don't understand so there's there's that there's that sort of 
I lo- it for me the big hook with history is the story element um in a very basic level but it's finding the story in the big population studies in the in the in the things which don't look like they have a story like you know hey how about the history of fiber optic cabling well actually it's very interesting <laughs> you know yeah. there, there are things in it which aren't actually linked to people and once you start to sort of you know, see these great sweeps and movements and ideas as as the sort of um, what do I mean? I don't mean components. I mean um, character, but not character. Proponent, the, the the driving force of a story being an idea rather than the central characters. Then communism becomes a lot more interesting as a sort of thing. So yeah, so for me, so we we return to the same stories which are easy to understand when we're kids because those are the ones we can easily process mm. and the ones that everybody sort of goes into for those reasons, I think. I think it's the it's what can you learn from these stories. It's like, you know, when you go on stage, I'm talking to a, a fellow comic here, yes. you, you don't need to remember your good jokes because you know, because they, they they almost like embed themselves in you. You yeah, know yeah, when to yeah. say them, and it's not and it's not a case that I've said them so often that I know this works. It's if you've got a brand new set, like you've been trying out a new ten minutes <laughs> or something, it's and written you written all up your arm. It's exactly, written it's your written hand. all up your arm. It's written in your notebook, which is on the side. You got your timer and everything else. The next time you do that, there'll be certain jokes that you don't need to remember mm. because they went well. Yeah. And when they went well, you've got that automatic, I know they went right, I can hit the beat even of it, and you're just like, badunk, that works. And it's the ones that didn't go well that are real pain to remember. You're just like, <laughs> I need to get to the next joke, which is good, and that's the thing. And that's because you have I mean, sort of instinct for the story. So I think what we teach our kids tends yeah. to be the instinct ones. Yeah, 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 the ones that are, the we're, we're introducing them to the idea of, of narratives yeah. initially, and then they become more complex as we develop or hopefully they become more complex as we develop it's just yeah. that occasionally people don't necessarily get introduced to those later ones yeah i mean However, uh, yeah. i understand that you 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 were uh, so we've got a couple of elements that have come up there okay uh, first of all you are a comedian as well Yes, we haven't that I, one. I had a weird gig um, on Thursday, which yeah. I think half of it was comedy, and then I started getting into Iron Age names, and I was like, I'm really <laughs> I'm so sorry. There is no joke here. I just like saying them. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, at yeah. Which, at which point does it become amusing lecture? Exactly. This is, well, that's kind of what, you know, I've always, like, some of my favourite comics, like, and I'm going to say this genuinely out of love. But like I will go and see people where I know I'll probably laugh three or four times in that hour heartily. <laughs> and I will go and see them over people I know I will laugh my ass off for 40 minutes. You know, solid. So and and those people are Robin Ince. And it's simply because what he has to say, I find engaging and I enjoy it and I giggle and I think and to be honest, you know, I've done like you know, headline sets at big clubs and that sort of thing. And I'm 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 basically there trying to prove myself rather than it coming natural. But I can stand up and just you know, just before Christmas I went down to Skeptics in the pub in Cambridge and and I'd, I'd literally had no time to write and prepare anything. And I'd done it earlier in the year, so it's like, oh my God. So I just went there and I got up on stage with nothing and I spoke for forty five minutes without any need of notes. Or anything. <laughs> All the exciting bits of history I'd been reading and just going like that got laughs, was entertaining, but it's not that same level of funny, yeah. like boom, blasting the doors off. I got some good laughs, though. I did. It was very good. <laughs> You're such so, a comic. So, You're so, such so a... <laughs> good. Yeah. When did you first start comedy and when did you first start doing um, historical elements to your comedy? So I first, my first ever gig I did as a dare when I was a teenager back in 2001. And I did that and I got 10 quid. And that was good. And in so doing, that gig on stage with me was an open spot called Paul Carenza, who is now a big comedian who writes for things like Not Going Out and Top Gear and is all over the radio and that sort of stuff. Anyway, Paul... um, then sort of said, hey, you're fun, we're friends. And um, I basically made friends with him and his friends, and then he was taking a show up to Edinburgh that year. So I went and did the Edinburgh Fringe back in 2002. Wait, you did Edinburgh, like... 
a I, year, less than a year after you started. Yeah, but I was an act, I was acting in this play. I wasn't doing. Ah, right, okay. Then when I was at university, um, a few years later, I thought I'd give stand up a go, and so I gave it a go. Did quite well. Got to British Award semi finalist, that sort of thing. A British Award, BBC Award semi finalist, and I went up to Edinburgh again. What did I do? I was I was doing a sketch show. And I did a sketch show um, at the Pleasance on after a guy called Michael McIntyre. So, uh, I think I've heard of him. Thank you. He's not around as much anymore, though. No, he's not. Uh, but yeah, so he was he was on in the show before me, and then we were doing a little sketch show uh, called Schizophrantic. <laughs> Nice. It was it was it was brilliant. It involved um, a sketch that started um, going. Um, Excuse me, is this a music shop? Uh, yeah, it's a music shop. Um, do you have any spoons? That sort of you know that sort of level of comedy. Norman. Yeah. Norman. Why would he be asking for spoons in a music shop? It <laughs> writes itself. Exactly, it didn't. Anyway. <laughs> So it did that, and it, when I was flyering for that, I met Will Hodgson. So when I went to university, which I so it must have been, yeah. So the next year I went to university, and that is when I met Will Hodgson. And then he said, oh, um, come up, uh, um, I'm doing a show up in Edinburgh. Come be my guitar-playing idiot. And I was his guitar-playing idiot, and he won Perrier. So, yeah, yeah <laughs> which is pretty- so I got to go to all the Perry. I got to stand next to him on the stage and hug Christian Slater. Oh yeah, oh it was a big deal. And then um, and Christian so was, Slater. Christian Slater gave that award. Yeah. Right. Exactly. He's 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 Diddy, but very exquisite. Anyway. So... <laughs> I think I've also read that in the British Museum's China Wing. Indeed, indeed, <laughs> Diddy and exquisite. Yeah. The biscuit. Anyway, so I um I I basically had a little bit of comedy. I got to do, you know, I I I entered a few things. I did quite well, and then university ended, and I was like, I've got to get a real job because I've got to get out of my mother's attic. That didn't really work. So because it was, <laughs> I left university, and then the economy exploded. Ah, oh. uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was made redundant, not sacked. I was made redundant eleven times in one year. And then I was like, oh, I think the universe is telling me that it's going to be possible. <laughs> so in 2008, the sort of yeah. winter of that, I started up again. And um, it was it was great. So I think my first gig, I was on right after Andy Zaltzman. And that was, yeah, that was, that was like, wow, that's cool. And then, um, yeah, and Reg D. Hunter, I gigged with him very wow. early on and wow, you were hanging out with some real big hitters for i the know British comedy scene aren't I, you? well this is the thing because i wasn't in london so it was local clubs where you know uh you know who had these big headliners who don't want to pay anything for the other acts because they've got these massive headliners so uh they they paid me nothing and i went on yeah. did my 10 minutes and thank you very much so and and yeah and so and from there i came i was very bored of the circuit um doing all right in it you know get, earning keeping my cats alive and um then came... <laughs> i like that as a as a bellwether of how you're doing what the, happened the, yeah exactly. the cat's moved into another house and lives with another family now i need more gigs and so after that i um yeah i i basically i've been doing some gigs so i did simon's what simon watts gig um ugly animals and i was doing a few more sort of like alternative skeptics in the pub type gigs and i was like oh this is this is much more fun <laughs> than doing the circuit and so i thought i need my own show and i came up with the z list the z list dead list which is um about obscure yes. from history and well, that's interesting so the the stuff that you were doing on stage came about the same time as you started z list dead list yeah, like when you started doing it came for Z list. Yeah, that that's literally what happened. Is that I was, um, I was writing stuff for skeptics, and I was reading all these history books without any purpose, just because I liked them. And then seeing all these great stories and going, well, there's no way to tell these on stage. But at the same time, I was doing shows where I had to talk about the scrotum frog for twenty minutes. So, which is that, by the way, is completely real, even yeah. better. Better than it being called the scrotum frog. It lives in Lake Titicaca. So, how beautiful is that? And if you don't get that joke, good. Good. You're <laughs> in a so, That's anyway, <laughs> exactly. So, I, I, I thought, you know, these yeah. stories need um, hearing. And also, you know, 
I, I sort of was getting to the point where I was thinking, well, if I want to work with these people that I want to work with, I can't sort of wait for an opportunity to come up. I've got to create the opportunity. Mm. So, so, so someone who maybe hasn't been exposed to it, could you explain what the Z list dead list is? It is basically um, what I do is I get like some comedians, some historians, and some random journalists to um, present. Um, a little um, like a, a 10 minute skit about somebody from history who is not famous, as in you've probably not heard of them, um, who is dead, um, who isn't a god or a deity. And they're going to champion this person for um, this length of time. And then all of the other people do it, too. They all present it. And then the audience has to vote for their favorite. So um and that person will get put on the Z list dead list, which is like the ultimate, you know, memorial, completely official on my website. So it's that, and it's it's a really fun little night to go to, and it, it sort of took off. We had a few, um, you know, we had a quite a lot of sellout um, shows in a tiny little room in Camden, and uh, no, it worked very well. Um, so off the back of that, you started doing a podcast of it as well, didn't you? Yeah. Or was the podcast there straight away? Well, what I did was the first show I recorded, and I never turned that into a podcast because there was things with the cameras and it was all a bit weird. But um, and then I thought oh, I should I should just record these because these are this is fun and maybe I can. I, I was literally thinking I need to sell more tickets to the next show, and then what would happen is the audio would be good, but the camera would be shoddy and in the corner people get up. And so I couldn't really use it. So I, yeah. I did these little adverts for the Zedless Deadlist. And I thought, oh, I've got all this audio. I know I'll just record and I'll podcast as well. Cause I, I was quite a big podcaster already. I'd already been podcast. I, I started podcasting back in 2008 about the same time as I, how, how many podcasts do you have now? Currently? Yeah. Oh, no, no, no. So let's say, let's go double up. Uh, how many do you have currently and how many have, uh, now defunct there's only two that's defunct so it's not it's not that many so i've done like i've been on a lot of podcasts which is why it, it sounds ridiculous if you look at the list however um what um, i started with sunday supplement which was me and my friend simon um basically buying a newspaper on the, uh, on a sunday reading it on a monday recording on a tuesday and working out which paper you should have bought last sunday that's... <laughs> <laughs> that was it was but excellent for the busy time traveler exactly it was it was silly it was it was fun but we'd only look at the supplements as well so we wouldn't look at the big news we'd look at the supplements and we would just marvel at the same things coming around every april there'd be glamping you know you know there'd be staycations yeah. every oh my goodness it, it drove us nuts anyway so uh <laughs> So there was that one. Six tips to a cheaper Christmas. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so so it's it was it was that was fun, and we kind of we we at the same time as that went on about six years into that we thought oh let's so because we must we're just trying to work out how old the next one is so it must have been about two three years ago we started Seti Sopo, which is um about which is basically me and Simon again talking about the opposite of things which don't have a natural opposite. <laughs> Nice. So, for example, what's the opposite of a motorway? Well, 10 minutes discussion later, it's Tarama Salata. That is exactly, I mean, you think that's a bit odd, but actually it works. So, right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, it, you know, because otherwise, what is the opposite of a motorway? It's not a B road, is it? That'd be easy. So, no, we no, do. So, we, so it's that sort of happened at the same time and then morphed into that. The other one that I started and gave up on was um, the Women's Fitness Podcast, simply because me and Kelly didn't have enough time to continue it. But I just met Kelly in the gym, and she's just the most amazing woman who needed a podcast because I just needed to. I just needed to sit and listen to her because she's just great. Um, <laughs> yeah. And it was an excuse for us to meet up and have a cup of tea, and that still gets quite a lot of downloads. So we we just left that to to be, and. Um, and the history ones, I do the Z list Dead list, which is awesome. Uh, which comes out. I, I started it in series, and I started trying to do it bi weekly, and then it became monthly, and now it's just whenever I can, because um, yeah. yeah, it's just. <laughs> you mean the natural life of a podcast? <laughs> exactly. Um, but you know, it still gets. You know, we. Um, the last one I did was Erid, Edward Orange Wildman Whitman. No, no, Wild Man White House, that's it. Edward Orange Wild Man White House. An orange wild man in the White House. I know. He was the man who laid, <laughs> he laid a uh, telegraphic cable yeah. um, across the Atlantic and bur burnt it out by 
doing the equivalent of shouting. So you don't need to listen. <laughs> um, <laughs> that must have been so annoying. <laughs> no, you know, he's an absolute dick. It's amazing. <laughs> but, oh, the amount of effort to then just... Yeah, he, he literally... Anyway, it, quit. he was just he's such a moron. Anyway, so so uh, listen to the podcast, you'll find out why. So, yeah, um, so do that. And then I got asked by the British Museum, because I started to do... The Zealous Deadless took off a bit, and we were selling out this little venue. We got a little bit of press, and then the British Museum said, oh, that sounds like the sort of thing we'd like. And so um, they, have, they had me sort of doing it in London, and because I had this big venue where I had to sell, you know, 330 seats... Mm. Um, it, 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 I sort of um, um, anyway. Point is, they then said, "Oh, we've got all of this old, you know, um, audio from previous lectures. Uh, we don't know what to do with it. It'd make a good podcast, wouldn't it?" And I said, "Yes, it would make a good podcast. You should pay somebody to do that for you." <laughs> and then yes. they said, "Oh, we could do that, couldn't we? Uh, would you like?" <laughs> and I was, yes. "Yes, I would." So um, I do a podcast called the British Museum Membercast because it's about the members' lectures. And Membercast is also a very funny thing to say, innocently. So, um, yeah, so that's been going now for a couple of years and does very well because it's got the words British Museum attached to it, I think. But also yeah, yeah, we've, yeah. Got, we've got a few loyal listeners who write in and everything else, and it's a good fun. And then, of course, Making History, which does count as a podcast because it's on my podcast app. So yeah, you know, never mind all of that. So those are the, all the podcasts I do, and that shouldn't have taken twenty minutes to say. <laughs> <laughs> and yet, and yet. And so yet. let's have a let's talk about um, the the new shining part of your career then, um, making history. Yeah, so it, it, was this it, your first series you co-presented? Yeah. So this was right. the big. This was the big. The BBC weren't going to commission them again, or it was going to be very unlikely that they would commission them again. So they needed to etch a sketch it a bit and change it up, which they do regularly. I mean, it started out as a show back in the late 90s, I think, where they had people write in before there was Wikipedia and ask questions. And they would, in, you know, they'd go find an expert and interview them about answering the questions. And it was kind of like a history, we're making history together show type thing. And yeah, yeah. then it sort of turned into this more magazine-y format. And, but it was about making history, what's happening in the world of history right now. And it was all archaeology and everybody went mad. And then, and then it sort of turned more magazine-y. And they were like, we need to make this a bit more focused. So we've actually spent the last series on types of lines so we started with the Meridian, and we had HS2, mm. and then we had things like bloodlines, so we went a bit abstract, and bread lines and supply lines, and the, so the, all these different types of lines. So each episode has this sort of focus point of having to be about this subject, but at the same time, that includes, like, a lot. So it was, yeah. it was, it was really interesting. It was a really nice thing to do. Um, but, yeah, so um, it is my first time, though, as um, I can now say on the CV, you know, instead of uh, I report for making history, because that's what I used to do. I used to do a little segment here and there. They sort of send me off to Timbuktu and well, or um, Stevenage or somewhere uh, <laughs> to do do a little. We all know which of those is more likely. Indeed, budgets being what they are, but you know, I go down to Taunton and have a look at some benches. I did do that, so I I went. Um, so yeah, so it was it. it so that I, I've just had to sort of go in and just go, oh, yes, I'm equally as authoritative about history as Tom Holland. This makes perfect sense. <laughs> but um, <laughs> do you have a do you do, like how does how does one prep oneself to do that kind of thing? How, it's, is is, you is know, there anything that you like? Two weeks. Seen? It's two weeks before A level. Right. That's what it is, because basically <laughs> that's what it feels like, because we got given the go-ahead for this series. It's an eight-part series. We got given the go-ahead for it late November, first day of broadcast, first of January. Right, so that's quite a quick turnaround. So talk that's me through it. Ridiculous. Right. Yep. I, I want to know a couple of things. First of all, um, your initial involvement in the programme was through the reporting. I just want to know how uh what you do when you are uh, asked to commission one of those and what one of those looks like and then we'll get on to the main series and how uh that initial development program what you were doing in that uh, okay so let's have a look at the nuts and bolts of it so um the reporting the reporting so what would happen is i would get a call from the producer saying um we're thinking of doing x y and z which one of these ideas do you, you know what do you think of these ideas x y and z and i noticed that x is like the history of a dead swamp 
the B would be like, oh, the history of a wall, which you'd love, Paul. And uh, yes. or the or the third one would be, oh, the history of all these people murdering each other. Which do you think? Would be best? <laughs> which do you think would be best? And I'd go, well, the one of murdering. Okay, well, I'll get, I'll book your train tickets. And so I would be just basically, I, I was very much, uh, you know, you will learn this, you'll get this. We've sorted out who you're interviewing. Mm. Go for it. Um, so I, I I would spend a lot of train journeys desperately reading up about the history of prison reform, and you know that sort of stuff, and and go up there. Um, but the producers have a very because it's only six minute segments or maybe eight minute segments. It's either six or eight minutes. It's really tight. You have to summarise everything, as well as describe something without saying I am stood, because that is like the that is the um, the I'm going on a journey part yeah, of um, history. You. Yeah, you just can't <laughs> say. So it's like we are here, I, but there's a gate. Um, but yeah, so it was it was so, it's so much fun because there's no pressure on you to do it. You know, ultimately, I've been cut off mid interview. Going, Izzy, this is fascinating. Can you just ask her what colour that is? <laughs> <You know? laughs> but you know, the point is, it's all edited as well. So it's it's about getting the right questions, about relaxing. But the, the main skill of it is you have to relax the person that you're speaking to, and you have to sort of say, look we do not want to make you look like an idiot because we've travelled all this way to not make you... Because you are the an expert. So fret not. We're going to make it good. If there's something you're not sure about, we can pause, you can look it up. And it's about relaxing them and thanking them and being lovely to them and drinking as much coffee as possible. Oh, That's it. I, I think you surprised <laughs> me. You thought it would have been tea in the heritage industry. Uh, oh, time. yeah. No, no, I'm a coffee drinker. I need my no. coffee. You media types with your frappe yeah. rappuccinos. Mm. Mm-hmm. Oh, no, just, just Americano black. I just need the, the battery acid, please. Oh, wow, so, wow. <laughs> that's me. Um, but yeah, so I um, so so from there, that's a whole different world presenting. Because presenting, you've got the same research that you have to do, mm. but um, it's for four segments, which you have to know because you have to introduce them, you have to say something about them before... And oh my goodness, it's um it's a lot of work a week just to wow. get a really good understanding of the history of certain things. I know so much more now. It's ridiculous. <laughs> you know, the more I research, the more I realise I haven't a clue about anything. But oh my I know so much more than I did. But the way that works is I'm much more involved in, for example, the breadlines episode was mm. one where I picked, I think I, I basically came up with the idea of breadlines and I also helped I mean, I, I suggested lots of different topics, of which I think three were taken. Battle lines, I think Tom Holland's, all of his selection got through. That was oh, my wow. thing. He was just like, I want to do Zulus. Okay. I want to do Thucydides. Oh, okay. I want to do, like, Shingle Street. Oh, okay. So all of his stuff, you know, so there are right. episodes which are very easy led, and there are episodes that are very Tom led, but hopefully you don't notice those as much. But it's literally like we have a meeting. We go, what should we do? We've got a historian that works... Um, um, so we have Sean or an occasionally another person working, sort of doing research in the background of stuff. We have uh, a producer, often Alison or Craig or Kim, who will be in charge of the show. And we have our executive producer, Simon, who goes, I don't think that will work. Uh, <laughs> I think it's a brilliant idea. That's what he, wow. very sweet. He goes, I think that's a brilliant idea. But <laughs> I don't think that will. Anyway, so. There, there's a lot of considerations of what gets done, what it doesn't. Um, I will, I insist on having some sort. Of, we're going to have to do battle reenactments at some point and martial arts, um, modern things at some point because I know very, some very good people who know all about how to hurt each other with armor on, and I think it'd be an excellent segment. However, um, it's finding what fits into the show and what flows from the show and everything else is. Um, it's, it's, but it is just like revising A levels. It really is cramming. So I spend, because where we record is down in Brighton, and that's about a three-hour journey from me, and I spend that entire journey reading, just going over my notes, going, okay, this, this, and this, because I'm going to sound like an idiot anyway next to Tom Holland, so I may as well <laughs> know a little bit, just a little bit about what I'm talking about, because, I mean, there's no way anybody can know it all. There's no way no, no. everybody knows Thucydides, Aborigines, and Zulus. I mean, you just can't, you just can't. 
So, you know. Tom Holland tries very hard, but... Uh... Oh, no, I mean, he, he he will claim that he knew it all. He doesn't need to be a book ever, because it's just somehow he is history. Do you, uh, feel, like, um, do you feel like you're occasionally the... Do you, do you think you stand as the, the, the sort of the proxy for the audience, or... Are you try? Do you present yourself uh, as more of the authoritative voice? It depends on what we're talking about. So on stuff that I know about, for example, we did um, James Barry, which is an amazing story about a woman who, at the age of sort of eighteen, um, moves to London, joins a medical school as under her uncle's name, and then spends the rest of her life as a medical surgeon and argues with um, Florence Nightingale and things like that. And about whether... So we were talking after segments about him or her, whether he was, in fact, a trans man. And, you know, a large section of our audience doesn't really understand what a trans man is. So I'm the one who's there going, hello, this is the basics of gender studies. <laughs> which I, I And I, I feel more authority on that, knowing a few trans men than, you know, somebody else uh, who might not. Um, but it is that it depends on the subject. I'm not going to tell, um, you know, Tom Holland all about what I reckon Xerxes was about. Because <laughs> <laughs> the boy knows. Um, yeah. Equally, you know, he's trans. He's written a brilliant English translation of Herodotus. I'm not going to go and say, didn't Herodotus say that, actually? Uh, no, I, I'm not going to say that. But um, point being is that I just have to be me and not overthink it. The moment I overthink it, then I'm just like, well, nobody deserves to talk about this other than the people who were there, <laughs> you know. Yeah. So you have to... I, I just see my job... My job, and it is whether I'm on stage or anything else, isn't to tell you everything, is to pique your interest in something, to make you curious. Because then hopefully you'll go away and buy a few books or you'll go away and do some research and you'll go, ah, you know, that that tends to be. And it doesn't, you know, and I, I would say the same thing about, you know, when I'm doing presenting about, you know, frogs or whatever. It's that that thing that you've got mm. to try and get. What about this is interesting? What what do I like to talk about? And to be honest, I can do, you know, you can do without a few dates. You can do without mentioning, oh, they actually had these sons and this thing and that happened. You don't need to mention that. Cut to the story. It's like writing a joke. You don't need all the setup. Get to the punchline because that's our job. We get to yeah. the punchline. We get the laugh. As a presenter's job, you get to the point, you get the interest. Yeah. In, so when you've got things like the Z List, Z List live show, yeah. Obviously, you've got that immediate connection with the audience. There's a certain um, acceptance that certain uh, some topics will be dealt with in a, in a really kind of uh, uh, in the moment, offhand, improvised fashion, and what's said in the room stays in the room. There's that kind of thing. Yeah. When you're working with the BBC, <laughs> a, a much larger sort of national, um, and it has a certain uh, because of the way that it, the unique way that the BBC is funded. Um, <laughs> through the license fee and all that sort of stuff is there um are there certain topics that you wouldn't cover uh, are there ways in which topics are covered that you have to ha add extra sensitivity and with the audience um what are how do you feel the audience uh reacts to the two different products what's the audience for the z list dead lists feelings towards it as opposed to uh, a Radio 4 audience? Well, I think uh, the difference is the Z-List, Deadlist audience and any podcast, I mean, you know us, you trust us. That's why we're in your ears. If you didn't like us, switch it off, never download us again, you know, don't leave us a review or anything like that. Because you're listening right now, it's like we're in your ears, we're yours, nobody else is listening, it's fine. When you're on the radio, everybody feels everybody else is listening, therefore they get offended for other people's behalf. I think there is that. Also, there's the idea that, and it's not even offended, it's get, they get irritated that you miss out crucial details that they think are important. And the point is, you have to go, we're going to miss out crucial details which are important because we have six minutes um, and we can't spend an entire time doing a show. And I think most people are understanding of that. Uh, the only thing this series that I was very, we did two things this series which I really wanted to, get the point across because I thought it was so important. We did um, uh, the Stolen Generation in um, Australia who were the Aborigines mm. who were taken from their parents um, by the most backward, weird, 
um, eugenics program where the idea was that you weren't going to stop them from breeding, you're just going to stop them from breeding with each other. So they would marry white people and then their genetic line would stop that way, which is the most unique form of eugenics I've ever heard in my life and just blew my mind slightly. Um, mm. Horrific. One actually, yeah. it's one that I think just... Yeah. Yeah, to say why it's important, it's something that's being paralleled by the Ouija in China. They're having a similar thing where they're giving mm. uh, financial uh, benefits to Han Chinese who uh, marry Ouijas. Yeah, you so, go. There you go. You see, history. It's history. Still happening. It still happens. You've got to learn from your mistakes. Um, but yeah, it's it's it's. But well, that sort of thing. I was very, I was very careful. For example. There were times when we were going through, and it, just in the production thing, there would be an off, offhand comments going, oh, so this Aboriginal tribe, and I was like, no, they're yobs. They're not, you know, they're, they're, they're sorry, they're mobs. They're not, they're not tribes. Um, and just getting the language right and showing that respect to people, because it is a tragic story and it's going to upset people just mentioning it. So you just want to go, this, this happens, let's try and get the things right. Equally with James Barry, I mean, there are a lot of people who say, he was definitely a trans man. How dare you question that? He spent his entire life as a trans man. But at the same time, there's a lot of evidence to say he wasn't happy as a trans man. And she wanted, you know, kept dresses and, you know, was thinking one day I'd retire, etc. So there is this sort of terrible, um, you know, balance to be had. What pronoun do you use? You know, and how you go around that. So we did have a conversation about that sort of thing. But ultimately... I think people are more forgiving than we think. I think what's happened in the last few years is that people who never, ever came across any sort of negativity are, are suddenly getting it. And by, by people, I mean white blokes who've written books and white blokes who've presented shows suddenly are finding that their opinions might not please everybody. And all they, they just get told, oi, we know that, shut up. Like Matt Damon when he sort of said, oh, I think there's a difference between, like, rape and making a joke is literally, and everybody's like, shut the up, Matt Damon. And then he went, oh, my God. And the reaction that people had to one man being told you're wrong is, you know, he was he was burnt at the stake. He was hanged. It's a witch hunt, and you're just like, no, 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 no. This is just one. There's a people disagreeing with somebody. That's all that's happening. And I think if you know, I've I've said stupid things, and when I've said stupid things, it's not like you know, if somebody wants to say that was stupid, um, I think that's fair. But I don't think you know, I don't think one mistake makes you know the end of a radio show. But yeah. Um, we are careful because there are some subjects which are incredibly difficult mm. um, and there are some subjects which are still, you know, even to this day, have huge ramifications. So you have to, but on the other hand, you can't not talk about them because those are the ones which are most relevant to today. Those are the ones we can actually learn from. Mm. So trying to get, you know, um, certain history there is um, and out into your ears and made you aware of it will actually help, I think. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say, like, it's the diversity of opinion. Is, is mm. that something that would benefit um, historical and archaeological uh, recording? Well, probably. Um, I mean, my opinion, I think, is the most important. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but no, I think, I think as well, there's a, there's a danger. It's not only about diversity of um, opinion. It's about diversity of research. So what people are researching and who's doing the researching yeah, yeah, yeah. is interesting. So there's certain, you can see there's certain demographics that go after certain subjects. And I find that quite interesting just from a sort of like, oh, who's talking about this? Oh, yeah. Woman talking about the suffragettes. Interesting. Uh, <laughs> man talking about, you know, war, exactly. War, oh, war. War. But war is so, so interesting. Um, so I don't, I don't blame <laughs> like, But, you know, it's, it's, it's this sort of, there it does seem to be, you know, uh, you know, you know, the idea of women's studies, and you're just like, no, no, this is this is everyone. But um, it, it's yeah, interesting to see the way exists people exists in a vacuum. We we we're, yeah, you know, everything is integrated. Everything has knock on effects on each other. So we, yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. But I mean, it is you know, it it seems a it seems a shame from a you know programming perspective that you just go, oh, let's you know make sure that we have a diverse people that we're interviewing, but all the people that we're interviewing, funnily enough, you know, black people care about their own history, so they tend to research black people, and it would be nice to sort of you know get somebody on talking about Agincourt who might not be English or French, you know, <laughs> there's there's 
you know but this this is what you know uh, yeah. this is the nature appeals, you know it's it's yeah. it, there's an element of the story some of the stories are appealing because they reflect aspects of the culture that the person has grown up in yeah exactly and so i don't see anything wrong with that but it does mean that i i do think that having a diversity of voices is important just just because not even for any like right on reason it just sounds better yeah. like right yeah. now like, you in your northern twang oh, we that. sound we sound amazing right now <laughs> we sound, this is such good radio this is this is amazing because we've got two different accents we're talking about you know in depth about very important things i.e me and uh you know, it sounds amazing, but it does. It does make a difference when everybody has a home county's accent. It does make you just tighten up a bit and go, "Oh dear, never mind." And yeah. um, you got a couple more projects coming up, but nothing you could talk about. Is that right? You, you, you're going to be doing I'll some mention, more bits and bobs. I'll, I'll mention um, this time next year. So <laughs> long way away. Um, I'll have a kids' book coming out, which oh, is quite. Cool. Cool. Yeah. It's um historic fiction, yeah. So it's um about Edith Garrods, who Naomi Paxton told me about first off. She did her for the Z List Dead List. So it's about the Jiu Jitsu suffragettes and Edith Garrod taught the suffragettes Jiu Jitsu. Uh, this is true. There is documentary evidence of it. There are photographs even. And um I've I've basically made up this um story of a kid called Lettuce Peg because it's Edwardian. And can you get a more Edwardian name than Lettuce? No, you cannot. And it's about how her mum is a suffragette and her dad is a policeman. Oh, I know. Tension. It writes itself, doesn't it? No, it doesn't. It really... <laughs> you still have to write it. So um, that is that is at the moment with the editor who I'm waiting on to get back to me with all of the different edits. And can you please just change change this entire story for me but that will be out um next year which is ever so exciting and i got i got that through twitter so <laughs> people re retweeting a tweet about edith garrod uh, that i because i did a radio 4 um thing about her made yeah. pick of the week and um yeah there we go got got a book deal off the back of it and i'm trying to write another thing which probably won't go anywhere but we'll see and i've got more meetings coming up which probably won't go anywhere but we'll see this is the life of a you just don't know this is the thing guys um nobody nobody tells you how much they fail because they're not allowed to talk about it just in case it might happen it's like it's like magic spells you're not allowed yeah. to you gotta you gotta just know that you know paul and i have a lot of fingers in pots right now and our fingers get burnt and or I, I have more burnt fingers though. <laughs> yes. I think I think you'd be surprised how many burnt fingers I have of yeah. going to meetings going, Oh, you hate my idea and me. Oh great, thanks. Yeah. Uh, oh well, yeah. next time. See ya. I look forward to one of those other kinds of meetings. Indeed. <laughs> yeah. But but they're weird because like the like when I got the present the presenting gig for making history, I just had several meetings with quite important people in the production company, like like the boss and uh where they didn't say anything like and and we're thinking of changing things up a bit do you, do you want to be involved and i'm just like yes uh, and it yeah. wasn't until november that they actually told me what that oh. meant so it was okay. a little like hey what they said well they, you said you wanted to be involved this is the deal are you are you happy about this and i'm just like well, yes i'm very happy about this but i'm also slightly panicked <laughs> <laughs> So, so, so it does. It does sort of, you know, yeah. Nothing seems to be a deliberate thing, and so yeah, it is about luck. And Richard Wiseman wrote a brilliant book about luck called The Luck Factor. And the answer to that is, you basically sling as much stuff as, around as possible, and hopefully somebody will notice. Yes. That is, that is the dream. Right. We've got two more questions, and My then I will leave you free to Sorry. roam the world. Yay. Causing the havoc that you do. I do cause havoc. It is fun. It's nice. Uh, number one, uh, if you were working on an archaeological site, would you prefer a site cat or a site dog? A site cat. Mm, why? Dogs are going to go, oh, it's a bone. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And ruin site. Also, um, I don't like picking up dog poo. That no. is one thing. And the thing about cats is they're self-cleaning, as it were. They basically get rid of their own poo and they're less needy and they leave you alone unless it's the middle of the night, in which case they get wet paws and come and sleep on you. So that's... Oh, that's so horrible. Yeah. Uh, and but, finally, yeah. 
last one. You work in the heritage industry. So how would you like to be remembered? Oh, um, oh. And the thing is, do you want to be remembered? That is really. Um, I would like uh, uh, just being an awesome black belt at jujitsu. <laughs> Ultimately, um, I what think. What belt are you on at the moment? I'm on light blue, so I've got light blue, dark blue, brown, and then black. I want oh. to get it before. I, w- I-, I want to get it in like five years, but I have injuries, so it's like hard, hard man. You'll get there. I will do. I just have to be able to jump over my own head repeatedly without anybody there. If I believe anyone is going to get it, I think you've got the kind of you've got that drive that means. Uh- I wouldn't uh, bet against you. I am, I am, I'm doggedly determined to do That's stupid it. things. <laughs> you and I have the same sort of approach. Exactly. <laughs> we might not be flashy, but we will grind you down. Exactly. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, Izzy Lawrence, thank you very much for talking. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, before you go, do you want to yeah. plug anything? Yes, um, go to izzy.com for everything. That is I-S-Z-I dot com, which I missed out of my big sort of history about myself. Um, izzy.com, uh, I bought that when I was 14. Izzy.com. Oh! How cool is that? <laughs> oh, back, that's a back when, it was, yeah. back when it was an Angel Fire website. Exactly. And I was still friends with whoever that guy was on MySpace, Tom. Oh yeah, oh is it? Yeah, it is Tom on MySpace, isn't it? I might still have a MySpace somewhere. That's terrifying. Oh god! Don't well, look for that. Don't look for that. <laughs> with, that with that creeping horror behind you. Thank you very much. I'll see you later. Thank you, Paul. Bye. <laughs> You've been listening to the Ask an Archaeologist podcast with me, Paul Duncan McGarrity. The music you were listening to was by From the Ashes. Check them out on Bandcamp. It was produced by me, Paul Duncan McGarrity. You can follow me on Twitter at AskAnarch or you can send an email at AskAnarch at gmail.com. But most importantly, if you've enjoyed yourself and you think you have a friend who might be interested in the podcast, please tell them about it. Write a review, put up a star rating, let people know that we're here. It's incredibly helpful. Much appreciated. Once again, thank you to everyone who has asked an arc. Bye-bye.